Um, my name is Brittany Allison. I am the Vice President of Programs for the Benita Democratic Council. And I am um, thrilled to be able to hear this conversation, facilitate this conversation, um, and really just take away so much wisdom from um, this panel. Uh, as everyone on here is aware, um, the summers of 2016 and 2020 saw massive increases of awareness and um, attention and advocacy um, related to social justice. And I think that um, that age of advocacy hit this, this huge tipping point in 2020 with the murder of George Floyd and the protests that erupted in the streets thereafter, including in our communities in San Dimas and Laverne. Um, and, and every community member, every person, every representative um, had this big question in the air of what are you going to do? And um, I've invited these um, four lovely individuals to, to share a bit of what they have done um, over, over time in this, uh, in this area. So we have the chair and vice chair of Laverne's Committee on Cultural Awareness and Social Inclusion, as well as um, a council member and mayor pro tem from Laverne who also are um, participants on that committee. Um, and what I'm going to do, uh, just to give you a little overview, is I, I'd like to have them each introduce themselves and share um, their involvement with Casey and, and how that participation started. Um, and then we're going to proceed into having some questions uh, to kind of lay a little bit of groundwork. If during the question portion or any portion, um, any of you have questions, what I would ask is that you would put it in that chat um, make sure that it is chat everyone or a message directly to me um, so that I can either interject with that question if it's a point of clarification or if it's a question that you have, then we can save that for the end um, when I hope to move into a discussion portion to hear from some of you, our attendees, about the experiences that you've had in your own networks, in your own committee, um, committee, committee community. Um, and as I had mentioned at the beginning, my big question that I hope to um, get a bit of clarification on is, is when do we compromise um, for the sake of progress and when do we push knowing that that's, that's at the risk of pushback. Um, and, and hopefully this won't just be this uh, storytelling, though storytelling is great, I want to hear your stories. I also want to hear strategies and I also want to know how we move forward effectively. Um, so I'll go ahead and pass it off to uh, Mr. Ivy, if you would start with that introduction and in my order, I don't know if it's different on your screens, but I see Mr. Ivy, um, Wendy Lau, Mir Davis and Julia Wheeler. So if you would introduce yourselves in that order, um, and go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Brittany. And thank you for inviting me to this very august group of people and some leaders and shakers here in the San Gabriel Valley. So thank you so much for the invite uh, to Cassie. I have to tell you that Cassie was formed uh, really in the early 2018s, 2019s, uh, as a discussion with um, actually Thomas Allison, who happens to know Brittany, and uh, Mayor um, Kendrick, Don Kendrick, and also Bob Russi, city manager of Laverne, uh, who individually then got together and talked about the issues in the nation and the issues in Laverne where uh, Thomas and myself and others were having issues here, even in the city of Laverne over the years, with mistreatment, unequal, uh, unequal uh, judgment and accommodations being made and trying to find a way in which to bring those forth to the attention of the city. Uh, the N-word has been used on some of our folks here in the city. And I have to back up and let you know that actually the census count of the city of Laverne is only about 3% um, African-American and 7% Asian. Um, 59 percent or so of, of white and then the remainder being of Hispanic. And so the biggest issues you have here is you have a city that doesn't have a lot of people of color in it and doesn't necessarily involve itself in any issues of racial tensions or relations because there just isn't that much a mixture going on to, to even get there. So as a result, some of our folks uh, find it found themselves in islands of a uh, of uh, desperation, of not knowing where to turn, who to talk to, or feel comfortable. And it was even a time here in the city of Laverne where the police were pretty aggressive with people not of, um, not of uh, the majority 
and would pull him over incessantly and harass him and, and just was making it very uncomfortable in the early stages. Uh, backing up a bit, I've been in Laverne, I've been associated with Laverne for about 45 years and through employment uh, with the Metropolitan Water District who has a big facility here uh, in uh, Laverne. And also through the fact that my sons, both of them attended uh, school here all the way through their lives and at Damien High School and Calvary Baptist School. And uh, my grandsons who are also here, one at Ramon and the other one graduated from um, Bonita High School and moved on to Azusa Pacific. So through all of that, we've encountered lots and lots of times where there were squabbles and issues and quiet complaints of discrimination issues going on. And when brought forth to the residents of the city through city council meetings and other places, uh, they were not laughed at, but kind of just politely listened to and then just moved on because it, to the most for the most part, many people felt that there is no discrimination in Laverne. There are no problems in Laverne. And if there are problems, there are self-imposed problems. And if there's a problem with crime, well, maybe you brought it with you. And I have to tell you, I've attended a couple of city council meetings and found that uh, one person told me to take, take it and my thoughts back to the ghetto. So that, and that, you know, that's the kind of stuff that you don't hear everywhere and at any given time, but it certainly is a, slightly humiliating and missing the marks. So Thomas and others got together and said, we gotta figure out a way to bring these thoughts and these issues together, especially what's happening in the nation. And through that, they came together and formed a, a mini committee, um, got in touch with me and Julie and, and some other folks around, uh, Carol Wheatley and also um, uh, Orlando Jackson, who's a veteran, and Remy from uh, Tri-Cities and a bunch of other people, including most notably, um, of course, Mayor Tim Hepburn, who came in later, um, but also Devorah um, Lieberman from the University of Laverne, formed together this committee and began to approach the city with our thoughts on the fact that all the things that are happening in the nation and the hate that seems to be growing, the hatred that seems to be spewing forth from people who seem to not understand what's going on, needed to be corralled and needed to be brought into order. And with that, of course, you had the uh, George Floyd issue that happened and all the other, Brianna Taylor and everything else that happened in the meantime, in the past uh, couple of years. And that caused us to say, people are not understanding what the issue is. If they continue to make comments that they're bringing it upon themselves, they're just lazy, they don't wanna work, they're a drag on the economy, they're a drag on the nation and they don't love America and they hate the police. So all that is untrue. And we had to figure out a way to bring that and put it into perspective. So we did that through Cassie and we approached the city of Laverne, um, uh, Mayor Hepburn and Bob Russi, uh, Chief of Police, uh, Nick Paz. And we were able to formulate, get together, present an idea and the city of course, finally joined in with us. And now we have representatives on the line and I'll turn that now over to uh, Julie. Hi, my name is Julie Wheeler, and I am um, born and raised in the city of Laverne. I've lived there for over half a century. <laughs> Can you say that and not have your face crack? Anyway, um, so my, my folks, after they graduated from Laverne College, uh, settled in Laverne and raised a family there. Uh, as you can see, a, a white family. And uh, I, like what Gil was talking about, um, didn't know that there was an issue with race in, in Laverne. Um, it, it didn't happen to me. I thought Martin Luther King Jr. had handled all of that way back when. And then I went to the University of Laverne and I started to date a black man. And I got a little education. So I got to see how it is when um, you're walking around town with a black person. And then I had two black children and we lived in Laverne and I got to see how my two black children got treated in this beautiful city of Laverne. So um, I work at the University of Laverne and was looped into this committee uh, by Don Kendrick and um, Devorah and 
Um, and that's how this got started. Is, is, am I answering the question correctly, Gil? Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. And uh, Wendy? Uh, hi, everybody. So uh, my name is Wendy Lau, and I sit on the city council for the city of Laverne. I was voted into the office right before the pandemic started. Um, so it's been a uh, it's been a in, you know interesting ride thus far. Uh, I, I'm sure it would have been interesting no matter what, but uh, you know the, obviously the pandemic com compounds everything a little bit. Um, I was really excited to be uh, a part of this committee because uh, you know number one, I, I am a minor minority. Um, I grew up in West Covina, not too far from here, but I went to college at the University of Laverne and fell in love with the institution, fell in love with the city, um, you know, and, and really wanted to, you know, to live here and move here. Um, so, you know, moved here, gosh, 14 some years ago, give or take. Um, and although, you know, I think there are some really good people, a lot of really good people that live um, in our city, I think that there is still, you know, to Gil's point and to Julia's point, until, you know, discrimination or racism hits you directly, you just don't understand and you just don't um, believe that it happens. Um, and so, you know, I'll, I'll share, you know, a little bit of a personal anecdote that sort of drove um, this a little bit home for me is, you know, after George Floyd was murdered, um, you know, in 2020, uh, during one of my very first council meetings during council comments, I commented on that and on the state of race relations in America and, you know, how we need to all strive to do better because we all have unconscious biases. We really need to educate ourselves and think about, you know, how are our words and actions affecting those around us? And this was not a condemnation of, you know, any particular race in general or any group of people. It was just, for me, it was an introspection into um, the fact that, you know, as you know, part of the model minority myth is about, you know, we, we keep our nose to the grindstone, you know, don't rock the boat, you know, do what you got to do and, and, and everything will be fine. Right. And, and realizing the complicity in doing that and how that advances discrimination and racism uh, across the board and, and how that doesn't help society get better when you choose to be a bystander and not an ally. And so that was the direction of my comments. That's, you know, I was speaking from my heart and really more about my own um, reflection and the ask that we all treat each other as, as, as we would want to be treated, right? Um, and the amount of pushback I got, um, you know, I would hazard to even call it, you know, some hate mail that I got out of that conversation or out of those comments was really jarring to me, um, incredibly jarring, because for me, saying we should be better, we should all be improving, we should all be works in progress, right? We should be continually developing, evolving, you know, to be the best human that we can be before we leave this earth, right? That should be our legacy. And the fact that I had people pushing back and asking me questions like, are you sure it was racism? You know, did it really happen in Laverne? Um, can you tell me what day it happened on and what, uh, what store? Um, can you, you know, I, I think you're starting a race war by, by having this conversation at all, right? And, and I think too, for too long, um, the status quo has been, you know, you don't talk about sex, politics, you know, uh, religion, right? Let, let's just, everybody keep quiet. But I actually think that's a, a very wrong way to go about things. Um, because the less we talk about things and the less we, we share what's different and amazing about each one of us, the more that ignorance of those differences creates divisiveness and allows for people to direct the rhetoric and direct the, the path that we go on as a community, as a country, you know, um, and, and I don't think that's right. And so, you know, as a former debater, you know, uh, Brittany was a debater too at the University of Laverne, as a former debater, as an attorney, you know, I really believe that the art of civil discourse has to come back. You know, it cannot be flaming on social media because I've had my, you know, I, my fair share of seeing, you know, comments made about me or other people, uh, you know, on social media that I, I would, I'm embarrassed for these people um, because my mom would wash my mouth out with soap if I ever said those things uh, in public. And so, you know, I, I think, you know, with the proliferation of technology and everything else, it's become so easy to slam someone, to flame someone, to troll someone and not see them for who they are, which is still human. 
And so, you know, I think like the humanity in me needs to recognize the humanity in other people so that we can try to bridge those gaps. And I'm not saying I'm perfect at it. I have moments just like everyone else where I'm just like frustrated all the hell. And I, you know, I, you know, it's, it's hard to take and it is really tiring. Um, but I think this group is a, a definite step in the right direction for us to have that dialogue, to share our lived experiences, right? And to um, educate, because I really do think that, um, you know, systemic racism, systemic discrimination exists. And for people who don't believe that, you know, I wish I could go back and have you come take the class that I co-taught at the university, which was um, called the monstrous other, the word, the image, and the law. And it looks at different segments and populations of American society where we have scapegoated someone, we have dubbed them the other, and how that is manifested in the art that you might see in that time period, right? Um, the novels that are written in that time period, the plays, you know, it, you can see it in, um, uh, you know, the treatment of people, and you can see it in the laws that are enacted, you know, Loving v. Virginia was not that long ago. You know, um, there's a whole slew of case law that's out there that demonstrates how, when we other somebody, how that can manifest into, um, you know, the practices of a society. And so if we don't talk about these things, if we don't have meaningful dialogue, then this is where we will see history repeat itself. So um, I could go on and on, but I'm not going to, I'm gonna pass it to Mira, so. Thanks, Wendy. Move. Um, good afternoon or evening, everyone. My name is Amir Davis. Um, I grew up in Laverne most of my life, and a good number of those years were right across the street from Julie Wheeler. Um, I wasn't born in Laverne. I, my parents um, were both raised in Laverne, but when I was born, my father was um, uh, working out of the national headquarters for our church, Church of the Brethren in um, uh, uh, Elgin, Illinois. And he was busy with being the national director for Brethren Volunteer Service. And I, I paint that story just a little bit to, to share with you that, that uh, my upbringing was um, unusual and caused me to be quite ignorant. Because when we came back to Laverne, um, it was at the request of the president, uh, Harold Fosnott, for my dad to start teaching psychology at, the, at Laverne College, now the University of Laverne. And uh, when he got there, he was quickly asked to be the faculty advisor for the Black Student Union at the college because they had a significant number of college students and yet they had no black faculty. And so I guess my dad in one way was considered the coolest guy um, so they asked him to be their faculty advisor. So I grew up in a house where we had a lot of parties for college students who happened to be black. And I thought it was wonderful. And um, so I grew up in this isolated street called Second Street. It took me a long time to get back here. I finally was able to move back onto my home street in 2004 or 2008. So it took me almost 50 years to get back here. Um, not quite the half century that Julia has lived in Laverne. I've, I've lived a few other places. But um, when I came back here, I thought, OK, I'm home. I can relax now. I had had um, Hispanic friends and Black friends and had a Black girlfriend in high school. Um, it was, you know, th this is the early 70s. So it wasn't the 60s, but it was the 70s. And, and Demita and I would go to, to plays and to musicals and to symphonies in and around Hollywood and spend time at her house and my house and at parties. Um, she wouldn't claim that I was her boyfriend, but um, we were just really good friends, I guess. That's the best way to put it, just to put the right context on it. But I didn't ever think twice about it. And then I came home and started attending my church here again. And a brother of mine, Eric Bishop, Dr. Eric Bishop, who taught at Laverne, um, one time we sat down and had a conversation and I, was, I started weeping because the Laverne I thought I grew up in um, didn't exist for my brother, Eric Bishop. And, and that was very disheartening. And at the same point in time, I had to figure out, well, what do I do about this? And how do I support 
my neighbors and my brothers and my sisters. And years later, as Eric and I were talking, he said, he said, I'm tired. And I said, I said, why are you tired? And he goes, because I appreciate your help, Mir, but I'm not your, you're not my burden and you shouldn't be my burden. And I said, okay, I, I, I needed to, to, to start taking classes and start understanding how my support needed to be uplifting and supportive and not just a burden on my brothers and my sisters. Um, so when the opportunity came up then after I was on council um, at the request of Don Kendrick and Thomas Allison and, and um, Bob Russi, we started sitting down and saying, what can I do to help with this committee on cultural awareness and social inclusion? And so I'm here. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you for that introduction. Panelists, I'm going to go a little bit off script and combine some of these questions for the sake of time. Um, I'm so thankful for you all to share kind of just like the framework. Um, and, and like I said, I think storytelling is powerful. So thank you for sharing your stories. Um, Gil, I would love to hear um, the actual um, like strategy behind why Cassie was formed, right? Like what goals they have, what impact you have. Um, you either already have seen or or hope to see. Um, if you could share a bit about that. Sure, sure. Hold on one second. Okay, yes, yeah, thank you, uh, Brittany. And thank you, everybody, for uh, those opening comments and introductions. You know, our goal, Brittany, is to create a dialogue on ways to improve the community's overall awareness and sensitivity to cultural differences. So that's our strategy. And our intent is to educate to inform, to encourage, and build awareness on building and understanding that every resident in this city has the right to be entitled to a wonderful and prosperous, happy and safe lifestyle. And that's what our goal is. And what we found in our conversations and our strategies setting is that the best way to get to this type of situation, to get people to talk, and to get people to understand where each and every one of us is coming from is for us to dialogue. You can't hate somebody when you're talking to them, although you can hate your, what you're saying <laughs> to them, but you can't hate and talk. We just know that. You have to be able to converse. And so when you look at the rights that happened at the Capitol on January the 6th, from people of color's perspective, what we see is a whole bunch of white people crashing into the Capitol, the heartthrob of this nation, doing all this damage, killing and hurting the police, and getting away basically stock free. So from our, from our framework, we're going, what's that all about? Yet, people who may have had a counterfeit bill, maybe or maybe not, or a cigar, or a cigarette, or just jogging in the neighborhood, are dead. And so you kind of juxtapose, 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 say the word for me, Wendy, juxtap, thank you. <laughs> I juxtapose. Just, thank you so much. <laughs> anyway, once you see that, and then you hear residents in Laverne White saying, there is no discrimination. It's all an imagination. If there's discrimination, show me a police report, show me where that's been reported, then that gets kind of under your skin and infuriates you and rage begins to build and then you put up walls and then you get out and start what in their words acting out when they're acting out is no more than just sharing and showing the reaction to how you're being treated and so the only way we can get people to understand that is to dialogue from the other side from the white perspective what they're saying is i don't have that experience i don't see what the problem is I don't know why you guys are burning down buildings. I don't understand why people are marching in the street. You know, if you guys just follow the rules, you'll be happy like we are. Not understanding that lots of minorities were prevented from owning property and homes and getting loans and being treated well and walking down the street and, and having people want to cross the street to get away from you. And it's just this whole perspective that if all of us understood the backgrounds and where we're coming from, maybe, just maybe, we can get this to be a better place. So one of the things that we've done as a strategy is to begin a program called um, dinner, having dinner or dinner with our team. 
Join us for dinner. Thank you. Join us for dinner. Thank you, Julie. Join us for dinner. And the whole point of that is instead of talking politics and hatred and anger, it's just a, an ability to get together with members of Cassie and residents of the community who you may not know or you may know but want to know differently. Sit down, break bread with them at the moment virtually through Zoom and just converse, get to know their family, get to know one another. What makes you tick? What makes you happy? What's the joyous things in your life? How are your kids doing? How are you doing? Do you enjoy shopping? Uh, what, what's happening? Do you enjoy the sports? How are the teams doing? So it's just breaking down barriers to have conversations for no other reason than just to get to know one another. And then from that, we hope to build a network of these dinners and spread out across our community here in Laverne and to be able to say, hey, I may not be happy with what I see. I think Asians are trying to take our jobs. I think what well, is this new thing, this, this cancel culture thing where Jews are trying to take my place. Perhaps that can be mitigated through just having dialogue and moving forward and getting together. So that's kind of where we are today. That's beautiful. It's beautiful. Breaking down those barriers. Um, Julie, did you have something to add to that? I, I did. One of the, um, the things we wanted to provide by having a committee is, let's say Gil has a, a situation in the city and Wendy has a situation in the city and I have a situation in the city and there's no formal committee. Where do we go with those experiences? And so what I saw was um, I belonged to the Chamber of Commerce. I uh, worked at the University of Laverne. Uh, Don Kendrick was a really good friend of mine. So whenever my boys, and they stopped telling me, but whenever they had a harassment issue, I would just go at one of the meetings that I went to. I said, hey, Don, I had my, my boys were, you know, like going to work on a skateboard and they got stopped by the police and shake shook it down, shaked down, uh, show us your weed. You have drugs. We know you have drugs. I mean, he's on his way to work. He has a Hollywood video shirt on back in the day of the Hollywood video, you know, and he's, he's minding his own business. So, um, so I get to say that to Don Kendrick, who goes to the police chief and the police chief comes up to me and says, well, tell me about this. But what if there's a person who has these experiences and there's nowhere to, to voice this? Uh, and I'll share something. The um, president of the University of Laverne, Devorah Lieberman, when she first got into office, there was a number of people who wrote to her from the community, um, angry that she was Jewish. And she's, and so here we have, you know, we're doing this work and we just found out, she said, I've never spoken this to anyone because I didn't know who, I didn't know how to, because that's, you know, it's, it's racial issues. And he, she didn't know, there was no venue. So what Cassie provides, we're hoping, is a venue for speaking, a venue for people to come to. There's also a community um What's the correct term? There's a community form. It's not incident. It's a community. Some there's a form, and if if you have something that happens in the community, you can get on there and you can say this happened and it might have been at um, uh, Vaughn's and you were this or that. So we can start compiling data. So that's one of the things, and then people can come and 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 come and speak. I mean, part of it's just the healing of like. This happened. How could this have happened in my hometown? Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I, I, I love the most about kind of your strategy is that it it brings it down to the fact that this is a this is a people issue, right? We want to talk about policy. I am all for advocating for policy. And there's a lot that has to be done on that front also to undo, like what Wendy said, years of racist legislation. But um, there's going to be people behind those policies. And um, the other thing that I love is that you open this up to it not being a education issue or a policing issue, right? And, and then it triggers people who are offended. Like, you think cops are bad? You think my teacher is racist like no we think people have issues and we need to talk about those people issues um 
And so Wendy, I want to, I want to ask you, how did you feel um, it got received being included and formalized into the city, right? What you mentioned a little bit about the pushback, what could the pushback possibly be when we're literally just trying to get people to talk to each other? Well, so um, I don't do next door. Um, because it is um, a frightening place. <laughs> um, I think it was, you know, it was supposed to be for good things, and and it it's uh, allowed. I think just some some negativity, but of course, you know, I'll hear things and I'll see things, or people will send me screenshots. And so when Cassie was being discussed and it was agendized on, you know, um, as one of the items to be discussed at a council meeting, you know, there were people on next door who were, um, how do I say this? Uh, who were trying to be. Uh, diplomatic about how they were phrasing their um, opposition to the committee. Uh, you know, they basically were saying like, you know, there's this committee starting and, and I'm just really concerned that this is going to take away from city finances. Do we have the money to do this? Do, do we really need this? Can everybody here on next door um, document whether or not you've ever experienced a racist act, right? And then of course you had a bunch of folks chiming in and saying, me, no, gosh, never, you know, and then clutch the pearls. Um, but then, you know, you might have someone else who might come in and say, no, I have, you know, I've been, I've been stopped or someone called me this name or someone assumed that I didn't understand what they were saying. And so said X, Y, and Z in front of me. Um, and so, you know, and this, so you kind of saw the, the back and forth. And I think that, you know, um, I saw in some of the comments that were kind of going by and I, and I have friends in Claremont, my, one of my good friends who's also a Laverne alum is a council member over there, but, um, you know, basically that it's, it's this sort of hidden uh, racism, right? Like we're not racist, this doesn't happen. So people have gotten sort of smart about couching what they're saying. Um, so it doesn't sound like they're being, um, you know, discriminatory that there's really just other concerns, right? Oh, how will we fund this, right? Um, when really like that's not, that's not the issue, right? And it's not for you to decide if something racist happened to me because that is my lived experience. That is my, you know, um, and, you know, happening. And that's great for you if it's never happened to you, but you know, you're also a white woman or you're a white man. And I'm, you know, and I'm not saying people can't commit prejudiced acts against you or that people can't be mean to you. Of course they can. But racism is something completely different, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think seeing some of that was really um, frustrating, right? And, and disheartening. Yeah. Because again, I go back to what is so wrong about wanting to be better? What is so wrong about wanting to continually educate and develop and improve and evolve so that we can be that beacon of light? And I said that during you know, my campaign and I will keep saying it. I want Laverne to be that beacon. I want our city to be that place where other people say, this is where I want to live because this is where people are kind to each other. This is where you can have a good quality of life, right? And that means for everybody, not just for some people. Um, so I think that's really been interesting. And I think the other flip side of it is that I started getting messages on, um, you know, people would find me on like Facebook or, or whatever and would send me private messages or they would email me um, because my obviously my information is available because I'm on council um, and say thank you so much for bringing this up. And so, you know, people who might not want to be exposed on a social media platform where they were already seeing what was happening, right, and they don't want to get flamed, they don't want to get drawn into the brawl, but wanted to acknowledge like, hey, I've been living here for 30 years and we've always been the Brown family. You know, um, you know, and, and people who would tell me about the history of segregation in the schools in Laverne, it wasn't that long ago, you know, and so, um, you know, the differential treatment. And so I think it's, it's allowing those voices to, like you said, Brittany, to, to even just talk about it, to experience that level of healing, to discuss, you know, what are the concerns and what have I experienced and what have I been afraid to say out loud because I've been the minority and I don't feel like it's safe for me to say these things, but now great. There are people who want to make a change. There are people who want to move us forward and let me share my story. And so I think it's, it's been interesting to see sort of both sides of that play out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that, and, and this is kind of the, the strategy, but it's not a strategy because it's relationship building. Um, but, but Mir, you shared your story of um, kind of going from, from being unaware to being empathetic um, mm -hmm. and then you tell the story of how that empathy had to take a shift to being an actual ally and not just like a, a lending ear I kind of got. 
and, and then I'm also interested in how do we get that allyship to also turn into to advocate, right? Where, where folks are actually doing something for the cause. Um, and I, I wanna know if you could speak a little bit to your experience and then I, I'm gonna wanna open up the conversation to everyone um, is, is I'm very interested in how we can work within our networks to get folks to go from unaware to empathetic, to allyship, to advocate. Yeah. Um, because I think we try to, I'm afraid sometimes we try to jump the gun and think that someone can go from unaware to advocate. And, and that's just not going to happen because it, it hasn't processed. They're seeing, like Nir said, you're, you saw a different Laverne at first, right? Um, so, so do you have anything to share, um, to share on that front, Nir? Well, um, it's, it's not a quick path, which, which is, you know, a, 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 an important realization to have because um, we do want it to, we want to fix it quickly. We'd like to fix everything and make it all good and move forward. And I don't say that in a dispiriting way. I say that in a, in a, in a rational way, because because Brittany, you're right. People are at different levels of awareness all the way across the spectrum. And, and I mean, folks that I work with at Southern California Edison, where I'm an applied mathematician, oftentimes laugh because I'll bring up weird analogies or something like that. Because people keep saying, like, for instance, people say, why does it seem like we always come back to this place again over and over and over again? I said, we are. This is home base. And we've just scored four runs. And so we got to go from home to first to second, to third, and back home again and get more work done each time we go around. But we are going to end up back at home. And in some cases, it feels frustrating. And in other cases, it feels energizing. So so that's one piece that we'll be revisiting this place over and over again. We need to not take discouragement from that, but recognize that we'll come together and then we'll go out and do some work and then we'll, we'll do some, you know, come back together again. And it'll feel like four steps forward and six steps back. And we're not quite sure whether we're gaining or losing progress, at, you know, each and every time. Mm -hmm. um, but now to go to your point, I mean, one of the things that, that I've done was to to run for an elected position in city council. And this is where I wanna be. And when people voted for me, they were asking me when I was gonna move on to the state or federal level. And I said, I'm not interested in living in Sacramento. I've lived near Washington, DC. I don't like that place either. This is a place I wanna uh, work and support and serve. So here I am. Mm -hmm. um, the other piece is, is that my dad as, a, as not just a psychologist uh, professor, but a Renaissance kind of guy, was always interested in having us look at opportunities that weren't necessarily linear or, or straight paths. So the pitch I'm gonna to make tonight is, I'm working with a group of people from the Laverne, San Dimas, Claremont and Pomona area um, on a, the idea of creating a public bank in our area. Because one of the things that I've learned is that while Southern California may not have some of the provisions in codes and requirements in, in uh, land ownership, that there are racist activities or racist behaviors going on in the banking industry and in other ways of, of trying to access uh, wealth or access uh, capital or, or borrow money to be able to, to start getting ahead. So there's a group of us working on the public bank of Pomona Valley and one of the things I'd like to do is, is have a bank in Laverne or a bank that serves Laverne, Claremont and neighboring areas. I don't want it too big because I want it to be able to focus primarily on serving the needs of our community and that being the collective community and not serving the desires of uh, for-profit shareholders. So I see this as an effort too. So I'm engaged in local government. I'm engaged in trying this radical idea of saying, hey, can't we recreate a public bank in Southern California? Um, and I'm open to other ideas as well. So, so there's a little sign that Don Kendrick actually bought me. You can see it at the top of my fingerprint. You can't read it, but it, 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 it says, think outside, no box required, because as Don has told me, he goes, Mira, you just, you, you take everything and flip it inside out and start looking at it again. So I invite mm -hmm. people to join me in this progress or in this process, in this journey. 
please ask and I want to join you in your journey and find out ways I can support everybody along the way. And, and fundamentally, though, I want to make sure that as we move forward, we try to continue to think about how we make on ramps to invite other people to join. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I found that when you tell somebody something that they don't want to believe, another thing that my dad taught me is when reality confronts strongly held beliefs, reality oftentimes loses. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we have a lot of people all around us that believe something very strongly. And so when we present reality to their strongly held beliefs, they just don't have any place to go with it. Right. Yeah. Right. That's good stuff. Um, Wendy, if you could share your thoughts real quick, and then I'm going to um, ask John to share a little bit of, of his experiences in San Dimas. Sure. I mean, I was just going to, you know, briefly say that, you know, I think this is, this is where it starts, right, is these conversations and these dialogues. And, but it's got to get out of an echo chamber. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say sides, but it goes for all communities, right? If we're in our own echo chamber, if we're only talking to those people who think like us, look like us, whatever, nothing is going to change. And I keep referencing this like George Carlin quote, and I'll, I'll leave it. But, you know, he, um, in one of his bits, you know, before he passed, he said, another plan I have for world peace is formal introductions. Basically that everybody in the world had to meet everybody else at least once, shake their hands, look them in the, in the eye and repeat their name and try to remember one, you know, outstanding characteristic about that person. Because his theory was... If you knew everyone in the world personally, you'd be less inclined to fight with them, right? And I think this is kind of the premise of the meet us for dinner or join us for dinner, right? Um, you know, and his his like quip at the end of the, the, the bit is, who, the Malaysians? Are you kidding? I know those people, right? And, and that's the mentality, like, you know, as we are so quick to judge, you know, um, judge, I hope that we can take a step back, all of us, and not mm -hmm. and say, wait a minute, like, I know that person, right? Because we do it in our own circles. Like, we give leeway to people that we know or we are more willing to give someone the benefit of the doubt when we know them, right? Because we want to engage in those dialogues. So, you know, my big pitch, like I said, as a former debater attorney, you know, uh, all of those things, let's dialogue, let's have a discussion. And, and if we need to remind ourselves what the ground rules are um, so that we don't chase each other away, I think that's important. Um, it's good to have different perspectives. It would be a very boring world if we were all exactly the same. So how do we have those differences and how do we have the dialogue? Yeah, absolutely. And that dialogue breaking down the echo chamber. And um, the the thing that I found most fascinating summer of 2020 was um, Laverne, clearly not immune to racism. However, I've been so pleased with seeing that it worked unanimously. The city council unanimously voted to support Cassie's mission. Um, when, when folks, when me and my husband called in, um, my husband asked the very simple question to all the council members, can you publicly affirm that Black Lives Matter? And summer of 2020, that was a statement to be able to say. And they unanimously were all be all able to say Black Lives Matter. Um, that wasn't the experience for everybody's community, even in this meeting. Um, so I wanna pass it off to a uh, council member at the near of San Dimas, if he could, um, kind of give his opinion on what he's just heard and give us a little bit of juxtaposition of how it looked a little differently. Well, thanks, Brittany. And, uh, you know, I really like the way Laverne has, has responded. Um, and this goes, you know, before George Floyd's killing, of course, when, when other things were, were going on. And just as the speakers have said, um, an, an undertone, whatever you want to call it, of, of prejudice and, and, you know, an outright racist acts or statements, they're, they're out there in, in Laverne and in San Dimas. And both communities are kind of the same uh, where they have, I don't know if we got a majority white in San Dimas still, but whatever it is, there's that uh, denial or not inability to see some of these things happen. I'm not going to give my whole life story, but I'll just say that from the earliest I can remember, my parents, um, you know, Talk, told me how uh, prejudice and, and racism was just wrong, out, outright wrong. And so that's just been the way it's, it's been through my entire life. Um, I'll just mention one thing and it's, and it's not uh, to do with America, but it, it, uh, it, you know, it indicates but when I was in eighth grade, um, for whatever reason, um, my mom had a book on apartheid in South Africa and um, I don't know how it came about. Maybe I asked or something, but in eighth grade, uh, um, I asked if we could talk about that. 
and uh, ended up having a, a debate, actually. We, I remember being on either side of the teacher's desk, and, and, and there we were going at each other whether apartheid was right or wrong. So, you know, and of course, I was surprised that uh, people uh, didn't realize that that was, was not a good thing. When we moved to San Dimas in 1985, my wife and I moved to the Pioneer Park neighborhood, which as you might know is, at least at that time, was ma majority African-American. And um, we started an organization uh, on something else, it was on historic preservation, but the neighborhood got involved. So we, we had, uh, you know, had a lot of interaction with, with everybody in that community. And I still to this day consider that the, uh, launching point, you might say, of, of me getting on the city council. Uh, fast forward, I've been on the city council a long time, and every now and then issues like this will come up, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, oh, a resolution on AIDS, or it's, uh, you know, Cesar Chavez trying to make that a city holiday, D different things like that. Actually, I'm sorry, it was actually Martin Luther King Jr., which actually, uh, we, we got that passed when I first got on the council the first year, actually making an actual city holiday. But uh, fast forward to the summer of 2020, and you know we had was aware of things going on, um, but was hearing more from the community, especially after the killing of George Floyd, about these incidents, and they would call into the city council meetings or, or tell us personally. And um, I went to the protest that was in San Dimas in, on June 5th, and like I say, unfortunately, we didn't have the group like you you all have in Laverne, which is such a great way. You talked about the dialogue and the and and the and the process, but I just felt that we should respond in some way, and so I decided to introduce a resolution, a George Floyd resolution, racial justice resolution, and um, I, I was telling Britain uh, telling Al Brittany the other day that uh, you know I I wanted to rush that in because I felt everybody on the city council would be rushing to have that kind of res racial justice resolution. I was floored when I brought it forward and it turned into some big to do. And, and as you know, uh, the racial justice resolution that I brought failed on a three to two vote. My good friend, Dennis, who is you know, right there with, with us on everything like this, uh, he and I were the ones who voted in favor of it, and it failed. So, you know, part of that resolution, if you read it, in the very last action item was to form a group similar to what you all have and have some dialogue where it would be uh, community-based, but we would also dialogue with the sheriff's department and just so that people, like you were saying, would have a place to come to say things and where the, the main thing was where, and I, I talked to the captain at the time, I said, w you can tell me how few murders we have, how few this and that and everything else and, and how, how much resources, but it's not for the sheriff's department to give their view of how everything works and, and, and everything. It's, it's how people, people's experiences and to have them listened to, believed, and then you know, that worked on and, and really a, a learning experience for everybody. And, and to, uh, but, you know, San Dimas is a little bit different. Um, you all know the makeup of the San Dimas City Council. And I, you know, talking about understanding people, I, I think it's also important to understand that, especially people in law enforcement felt that they were being uh, painted with a broad brush. And so could not, for whatever reason, uh, accept a resolution that did not include the law enforcement side of things. So the resolution that the alternate resolution that finally passed was that law enforcement component that had to be in there. Um, and, and we know we worked long and hard to get a good resolution. I compromised on mine a lot. And uh, you know when I talked to Eric Weber, one of our other council members, to try to reach a compromise, um, and we didn't quite get there. But you know, it was. It was a, a win for me to even get George Floyd's name in there and to get the word killing. So I, I, I didn't use murder. I said, okay, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll go with killing as opposed to what was in the other resolution originally, unfortunate death. It just, <laughs> I mean, it blew me away really. So, so anyway, that's where we are. And um, COVID is a thing. So I still wanna get something going 
like you all are, have, um, but more when we can meet in person. It's just easier to do a startup at that time. So. You're, oh, you're on mute, Brittany. All right. Thanks so much. Um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, he had mentioned, um, I don't know if everybody knows, but the makeup of city, San Dimas City Council, they have three law enforcement officers. Um, and that's one of the things that I, I, I highlighted about why I think Casey works, why this strategy works is you're not focusing on the flaw of a specific profession. Um, so what I would, with the few minutes that we do have left, I, I want to hear if any um, any attendees have any questions for our panelists or any thoughts to share, um, specifically if they've experienced something in their networks of, um, of family members, of friends, if they um, have in their advocacy witnessed that tension between um, between pushing and between compromise. Um, I, I had mentioned in my conversation with John, we didn't have a resolution at the at Laverne that talked about George Floyd or or any of that. Um, did that matter? Like, is that something we should have fought for? Or or was getting Cassie in, was that the win? Right. Um, and, and I'm interested where where you want to see advocacy move in our communities um, to make a difference. Uh, I do see in my own life that people live different realities. I had a conversation with someone just the other day um, in light of um, the most recent uh, police killings in Minneapolis, killing in Minneapolis that, um, I, I mean, I, I literally weep now when I hear again, because I want this to be over before I have to have the conversations with my children that Julie had to have with hers. And I, I posted something on social media about this. Like, can, can you guys get this figured out before my kid turns 16, please? Um, and she told me that all I have to do is teach my children to respect authority. Um, and so, so I listed, no, no, uh, I, I need to teach my children not to buy Skittles at the corner store. I need to teach my children not to play with a toy gun outside of a store. I need to teach my children not to get pulled over. I need to teach my children everything, not, not to be scared, not to panic, not to do anything, right? Um, and, and that conversation ended very quickly with her saying, I don't know what planet you're living on. Um, so where... You know, I think, Brittany, I think that's, you know, it's akin to what's been happening with women too, right? So this is not just a race issue, it's a, it's a sex issue, it's a gender issue. Well, why were you wearing that short skirt? Well, why were you going to that? Why were you out so late at night, right? And we focus on the victim or of, of these actions and not on the perpetrator, right? Mm -hmm. If you are doing something wrong, murdering, raping, you know, assaulting, those are the people that need to be corrected, not the people who are suffering at the hands of that action. Yeah. And, you know, that's ridiculous. Like, it's it's so hard for me. And this is where, you know, again, like I get a little bit heated. It's, this isn't, I don't understand the the disconnect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I'd like to add, yeah. add one other thing. One other thing, uh, and that is the issue of the rage and the pain that most people of color continuously carry with them all of the time, always have to be on, alert, always have to be cautious about what you say, what you do, how you look, how you see it, look and, and address people. It shouldn't have to be that way. The folks who are in the majority do not like to be uh, entitled with the term entitled. <laughs> they, they enjoy entitlement. And we brought that up a couple of times, Cassie, and in and, and discussions and when we formed Cassie, and people were enraged when you use the term entitlement, that whites are entitled, they felt that that was a four letter word. How dare we say that about them, that they are not entitled and that they worked to get everything they had and that we should have worked harder. And one of the things, yeah, one of the things that came up was also the issue of voting. And you guys should do the things to be better Americans. You need to vote. So what happened this past election? Folks went out and voted. They did what they were told to do and the right to do, they earned to do, they voted. And so now what's happening? We need to restrict voting now. So what it is, is this constant tug of war of trying to do the right thing, trying to assimilate, trying to be Americans, and then the rules continue to change every single day. So this is kind of stuff that we need to bring understanding with and how do we go about that? That is again, partnering, discussing, 
talking and then formulating action plan to change policy. So that would be our ultimate goal on Cassie is to help and achieve policy changes into the future to make life better. Awesome, I love it. Um, let's hear what your son has to say. Oh. And then, and then I'll pass it off to Yolanda and I see Isabel, your hand raised too. Well, I wanna give some credit to Tracy Taylor because you're stealing my thunder in the chat. Um, I wanna uh, first acknowledge everyone here. I think that what you guys are doing is beautiful. Um, I do wanna point out that this is a strategy, the relationship building that's happening. Proximity does matter. Um, the relationships that you form absolutely matters and the discussions that you have matters as well. There's a couple of things that I heard in conversation that I do wanna kind of uh, put a spotlight on. Um, there are a couple of comments that equated racism to personal quality. Um, I heard things like, you know, there are good people and then there, you know, I don't know any bad people, but then racism happens. So I think it's really, really important that we're very careful about that because racism is not a personal quality. It's also not a noun, right? It's a verb, it's an action that occurs. So there are good people, we're all good people and we all inflict racial harm, usually unknowingly. So I think it's important to recognize that when you're having conversations and especially when you're having the dinners because that will help bring people to the table. Um, and then I was going to recommend, Tracy already got it. Everyone should be reading White Fragility, um, whether you're white or not. Uh, it's a great book that helps kind of, um, it's like a, a map for how to navigate these kinds of systems. I would also recommend reading Kendi's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, because I think what Brittany is trying to say here, um, I, I do kind of want to challenge some of Brittany's pushing, but she's right uh, that we can have conversations all day and we can form relationships with our neighbor. But unless those relationships turn into action, then all we're doing is having a conversation with a neighbor. And yes, that is meaningful and powerful. But in the end, if we want to see real change, action has to happen. And mm -hmm. how to be an anti-racist will um, help get everyone there. So thank you, Brittany, for pushing everyone for that. And I hope that that's something that this committee will do together. Yeah, absolutely. Get those empathetics to allies and those allies to advocates. Um, wow, I see lots of hands. Yolanda, let's go to you. What do you got? Well, you know, I have a couple of things. Um, John has already heard this. You know, I've lived in San Dimas. I lived in Glendora for 14 years, removed from Glendora because my daughters, who went to St. Lucie's, by the way, I don't know, Devin, if you were the one that went to Damien, but my, my daughters went to St. Lucie's. Okay, uh, class of 2003, class of 2006. So um, they, they left, we left Glendora because they wanted to have more people that looked like them. So we moved to San Dimas and there's a little bit more people that look like them, but still not quite as much, right? Um, and we experienced um, different things as all of us that are people of color in these communities experience. But one of the things that I think I still continue to, um, we all deal with being a black family in San Dimas is exactly what we talked about. You know, I, I was got the COVID shot, right? And I was really sick and I just had this um, horrible side effect of it. Um, and it was like two o'clock in the morning, my stomach was nauseated. And I told my husband, you got to go to uh, 7-Eleven or to Kmart, you got to go get um, some medicine for me. Go, go get Rolaids. I don't care what you get. Just go get something because my stomach is killing me. And so I, the first thing I said to myself, oh my gosh, it's two o'clock in the morning. I have a black man. And I said, I hope that he dresses. He had to go out, make sure he had it. USC, unfortunately, we're USC alums. USC, I said, go get your USC hat, go put on a USC jacket, go make redress yourself so that in case you get pulled over by the sheriffs in this town, you're, you're a black man. And, and, and that's really, for all of you, that's how we still live our life in this community. It is sad, but it is a reality. And all of us, Gilbert and Devin, you, you know that that exists, right? Um, the other thing I want to share with you just happened on Wednesday. I am a member of the Rotary Club of West Covina. And I worked at Queen of the Valley. Your dad was, uh, John Ever was one of the founding uh, attorneys that started Queen of the Valley. And I knew your dad and mom really well, loved them. And um, we were talking, the city manager was uh, the guest speaker. So one of the things I wanted to bring up to him was what are our, our communities doing about this constant issue that we see about the police brutality that is impacting our young black men, young black men, black men, black men in general. What are we doing here in this community? And he did address it a little bit and said that they have some kind of bias training or something like that, that they're doing annually. But one of my other colleagues who is a 85, 86 year old 
um, white man from, um, from back east. He's a Princeton grad and he's a 45 year old, 45 year long Rotarian. He said, what are we doing about the diversity in the city of West Covina in terms of its leadership, in terms of police force, firefighters and the city management? Because I don't know if any of you know, there is no diversity in a lot of these city council, city management, there's no diversity and there's none in West Covina. And so the guy says, you know, we're very poor. We're not doing a good job at that. Firefighters don't have it. I said, your law enforcement definitely doesn't have it. It's, it's much better than the fire, but, and then the city council and the, not the city council, the city management, city manager, city manager, there's none there. And what was really interesting statement by Ken, my Rotarian, he said, well, I guess it's a hard issue because, you know, you can't push out white people just to have other people of color be in those seats. And I said, you've got to be kidding me, Ken. Respectfully, because he is 87 years old and I was taught to respect my elders, right? I said, what you're telling me is that there are no other people of color that are, are, have qualifications that can be in any of those seats and that we're pushing out, we have to, you're going to push out white, only white people are qualified for those things. You've got to be kidding me. What you're happening, there are very qualified people of color that can take those seats. They're just overlooked constantly. And I, and I said, to, and, um, diversity and inclusion comes from the top and city managers. And he doesn't know me from home law, but I said, D diversity and inclusion comes from the top leadership. If it's not there, it will not happen. And, and, and I just sort of left at that. But that just happened Wednesday, which really said to me, we've got a long ways to go because if that is the immediate reaction that we're gonna push out white people just to put in unqualified people of color, that is the immediate guy. And he, this is a guy that has the same politics as I have. This is what was really just yeah. mind blowing to me, right? And we get along on so many levels. So I just wanted to sure. share that. I don't know what. I still think we have a long way to go, but I just thought it is here now. And this is a, this is the mindset in 2021. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and that speaks exactly to the point that, that, that racism is not a, a good or bad person thing, right? It's just actions that people do. He is a, a good person, but is going to have racist thoughts because he's been grown up in a racist society. Um, I told someone that you can't grow up in an outhouse and not smell like poop. Yeah. Um, and we've all grown up in a racist outhouse. But the thing, um, that's the part about it, and I'll shut up, I don't believe he believes that that's a racist thought, mm -hmm. uh, Brittany. Uh, he just innocently said, well, but you're going to be pushing out white people. He didn't think about their qualified people of color that are mm -hmm. not pushing out anybody. They are equally qualified. They're just, and overlooked. Also, I just don't also, think he thought that. How did all those white people get there? Right. That <laughs> I mean, if if we just want to run with the status quo, right? White people would never leave because they're holding positions that yeah. um, people of color were not allowed to hold, or exactly. in cities that people of color were not allowed to purchase houses. Right. Yes. We've got to go back to all of that. Yeah. Well, um, so anyhow, I'll shut up. Okay. Real. Oh, I want to get to everybody. Okay. So let's go. I think I saw Isabel and Kara's hand first, and then David and Wendy. Hi everyone. Um, I live in San Dimas and uh, like my father-in-law, John explained uh, last summer, things didn't go as well as they did in Laverne. And uh, I'm really inspired by Cassie and what you guys have going on in Laverne. Um, and I, I have a question for those of you who are on that committee, especially um, Gilbert and Julia, I guess, you know, I love the idea of having those dinner conversations and, and building relationships through dialogue. Um, my question is, how do you do that with a person or people who um, have broken your trust or who have done um, harm or um, don't seem to want genuine dialogue? Because I think, um, I don't know, maybe, I, I don't know if I speak for some of the other folks who, who are in San Dimas on this call, but I think that is a big tension that's going on here is that, um, yeah, just, dialogue just feels very hard to have here. Well, that's very, uh, that's a big point. And what we're doing now initially, we're asking people to sign up. You know, we don't, we don't approach them. We just say, would you like to sign up to have dinner? So right now we have people who are willing and wanting 
to have dialogue with us. Um, one day, we, I'm sure we're gonna come to a point where we're gonna want to reach out to a couple of people because we know there's some issues and we want to have a dialogue with them. And in those cases, uh, I, first off, I always have the stamina to understand that no matter what the issue is, you have the strength and the ability and the compassion to overcome that from just your heart. You can, you can approach them with compassion, respect, and ask, would you like to have a dialogue with me and, and just chat about the things that are on your mind and my mind, and perhaps we can get somewhere. But I wouldn't force it. Don't force anybody to talk to you who doesn't want to talk to you. It, it will go nowhere, it just make things worse. So initially, we were just reaching out and asking people if they would like to have dinner with us. And then eventually we get to a point where we'll be more expansive. We have more people with us, obviously. And then those people who may know the people you're talking about, maybe they go and have dinner and have a discussion with those people and help bring them, help bring them into the fold. So don't, for, don't ever force it because that'd be a disaster. Don't frustrate yourself. Always go for low hanging fruit and then, and then move forward. Uh, Julie might have some other thoughts. Well, I'd like to say on one of the dinners that I was a host at, um, Jenna, who's in the corner or in my corner, Jenna here, um, she joined, she wanted to know what was going on. She had seen some evidence of um, bad behavior in Laverne. And so she uh, came on to join us for dinner. And I think that's kind of going to get, we're actually going to be preaching to the choir. But in preaching the choir, we're going to get people like Jenna who say, okay, what next? What can I do? Because there is something about being a community that says, okay, we're, we're together about this thing. And how can we do this together? And so I think that's um, important that we, um, we are gathering people of like mind um, to address those others. Um, the interns, we have uh, three interns from the University of Laverne that work with Cassie. And there was a, there is a person who doesn't believe that there is racism at the, in, in the city. And so we called this gentleman. Um, there was another committee member, myself, and a couple of the interns. And we just started to make a relationship. We probably will not change his mind. He may go to his grave, never changing, but this is what we can do. And just like what you said, Gil, there's no forcing, the person has to be willing. And so if I'm willing to, to have that conversation, great. However, if, you're ha if, you're, if you have like a continuum of willing, someone who's like so not willing, and then there's people, maybe, talk to the maybes. Yeah. I might Absolutely. even add, yeah, I might add one thing. We have a member of our Cassie uh, committee who's joined, and I can tell you right now, he's probably the most conservative, if not the most conservative person in Laverne. And, and you know what? We welcome him to speak and speak he does. He, ha he has, does not hold back what he's thinking. He made a comment just the other night, and Wendy will remember it well. And um, you know what? We let him talk. We let him get it out. He says, I know I, you guys probably don't agree with me, but, but you asked me my opinion and he's absolutely right. We want his opinion, you know why? Because it helps us formulate and understand what it is we're dealing with and how we can go about reaching out to him and making him feel more comfortable and hopefully get him to be more engaged with wanting to solve problems. So mm -hmm. let's take it as an example. Good, good. Cara, we've got just a minute or two left, but I want to get to Cara and David, what's up? Hi, my dog's jumping in the background, trying to like be part of the conversation. I'm like, okay, all of a sudden. Um, hi, thank you guys so much for this. Um, so my story, we moved about three years ago from Almani and I work in Pomona. Um, so I know some of the comments are about Pomona leading the charge and everything. And, um, but I think there's, in, in the city that we're in, there's a couple things that happened. I appreciate the, um, this dialogue. I think what you said as well, Brittany, there's a sense of urgency. You know, my son is seven, he's autistic, he's multicultural um, looking, he's a racially ambiguous, it's great. Um, but my youngest son is chocolatey, beautiful, and is twice the size of the other kids, you know? 
And I've already had some issues on playgrounds where the kids wouldn't let my son talk to him. Like it was just one of those things where let's check to see who his mom is first. And it's little microaggressions here and there. But when we talk about, you know, I don't want my family on display for people <laughs> to have a conversation. You know, there's, there's a certain level of conversation, but I, I feel the racial trauma that we touched upon of having to constantly put, it's not my duty to educate everybody. And I think there's a willingness that needs to be there for sure. Um, but I think, you know, the urgency is there, you know, I, we've got young kids coming in the system, we've got issues when, it, and it's not something where it can be changed right away. Because, you know, I have nothing but respect for Brittany, for Crystal, for, you know, trying to run for office. But what I saw, and the, the literally taking a platform of a sitting councilman to, to literally talk about and bring up somebody in a negative manner of color of a family of color is a target it is a violence um and it is something that's dangerous you know and so there's a fear that i have a righteous fear um of putting myself and my family as a target out there you know um that clearly isn't unjustified because you got you know sitting law enforcement at the helm of having these conversations you know at what point you know is there a conversation you know um two other points because you know i'm on a roll but i'll leave it alone i'm um, just fueled you know dante right just it hits me right in the heart we had a 13 year old that was just shot um in chicago where my son who was adopted um is from chicago you know and there's a lot of just parallels but um you know we have a, a benita unified assistant principal who um was fired or resigned but from racism you know we have stop Asian hate coming out, um, but I haven't heard any resolutions about anything, you know? And so it's like, it's great. It's beautiful. I would love to sit down, but I feel like the urgency is now. And I feel like at this point, like what specifically do we do to get from, you know, to get to the advocacy part, but also the protection part, you know, we want to see people represented, but how are you going to be represented in a location where what 3%, 8% and I'm Asian and I'm Filipino and, and black. So what 10% of the population. And if we're just going on race, maybe but like you know help me help me see <laughs> any advice because you know it's a bunch and then well, someone wants to say hi say hi hi <laughs> um and, and, it, and it's all for them and i agree with you on the urgency and that's why this conversation is going to continue our next month's meeting is going to continue the conversation on diversity and inclusivity specifically as it relates to education so we'll be hearing from um, at least a student and a teacher representative from Benita Unified um, who both participate on BUSD's diversity um, and equity committee um, because I, 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 some, some of the old folk aren't gonna change their mind, but the kids we still can win, right? Um, and uh, Wendy, if you could uh, share your thoughts and then if any of our panelists have some last thoughts, um, I'd love to, to wrap that up. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I am, these types of conversations always like fire me up because it, you know, sometimes you feel like you're an island, like, you know, to Kara's point, it's like, I'm tired. Like, you know, when does this change, right? Like, I feel like I've been having these conversations and trying to educate, but it, it helps me to know that there's a community out there. And, um, you know, I was on an AAPI uh, call earlier today for my work because I'm on the equity, diversity and inclusion team, you know, with work. And, you know, it was, how do we get our voices heard? How do we get out there? And, you know, again, to Kara's point, you are putting a target when you run for office, right? It, it, it's hard because it's easy to be the mm -hmm. slow. And, and Mir knows, because I've shared this with the other council members, when some of the things were going down with, you know, George Floyd in the comments and whatnot, why was I the only one that got um, messaged by some mm -hmm. weird anonymous like Facebook user that made some veiled threats about, you know, m that made me concerned for my safety, right? Like, but none of my other council members, although they all affirmed Black Lives Matter, did not get the same the same treatment, right? And so I think that's the daunting thing. So how can we be a better network for each other? And so this is what I can offer up because I wanna allow the other panelists to speak. I am a huge advocate of, like I said, lifting as you rise. If you're interested in running for, for elected office, I had no clue what the hell I was doing because there was nobody in my family that's ever done it in this country, right? But I am here to say, let me help you. Let me give you whatever tools you need. Let me give you my advice. Let me share my networks because that's the only way we're gonna change things, right? Is if we are helping each other and not being part of that divisiveness. And how can we support each other just when we're emotionally drained and just feel like, what the hell? 
another one, right? Like it, it, it's hard. So how can we be here collectively? Even if I can't hug you in person, how can I give you a virtual hug and be that support system? And so it's these conversations, these relationships, and we hope that they branch out. So I offer that. My contact information is readily available. Brittany has it. It's on the website for the city council. Um, but, you know, and I don't mean that just for if you want to run for office, but you can look up my resume, you can see what I do. If you're interested in any of those things, talk to me, even if none of it interests you. I guarantee you, I probably know someone and I am happy to connect you because I think that's how we rise together is making those connections. So please feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy. And thank you all of the panelists for joining this um, conversation. Um, that is is never long enough to to cover um because because i want to like keep you on for another hour and start talking like uh action items and strategize um and and who's calling who and where are we meeting next um and and, and maybe that that happens you know um but i uh gil you want to give your your last final thoughts and then we'll pass it off to um our club president matt Lyons, to take on uh club business Thank you so much, Brittany. This has really been an excellent forum in which to have our conversation. It was great hearing from what was happening in San Dimas. And I didn't realize you had so much law enforcement on that council. That's interesting and, uh, and a challenge, but it's not a challenge that should be uh, afraid of. You should be afraid of Just Face it and go forward, go back into the community and you form your own council like we're doing and, uh, and come from it from that way and uh, get like minds together and move forward. I think that we are doing a remarkable job of just having dialogue with one another. And I'm so impressed with the fact that this particular club, the, um, the Dems that you put together here are just outstanding people. Thank you, thank you for having us. And Cassie, as you know, will continue to work for going forward, making, as we know, the city of Laverne, the best place on earth, the crown jewel of San Gabriel Valley. And uh, we, we're gonna just be there for you. Whenever you need to come and talk to us, we're here for you. And whenever you wanna invite us back, we're ready to come back to talk. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Thank you so much. And everyone be sure to check. There's so many resources that got linked in the chat between um, books that were shared or, or links to the Cassie site. So, so take a moment to scroll through that um, while we uh, transition over. Oh, great, another link. Matt just posted um, a Facebook group y'all can join. Um, so that this conversation can continue. Um, Gil, Wendy, Mira, and Julie, thank you so, so much for joining us today. Good luck to you. Thank you so much for having this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.